Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop. Welcome to the 19th episode of my Ask Matt series where I answer questions and go into more detail on topics suggested by you, the viewer. Now today is a question I get quite a lot and that's how I use epoxy to fill defects and voids and cracks in my work because I like to incorporate a lot of those things in my work and I'm filling voids very often. So let's get into it. I have an example board as well as an actual project piece of something I'm working on right now. So here's a piece of cherry with a lot of voids and cracks that we can address as an example. And this piece is a little bit interesting because the cracks are kind of pretty big on both sides. So if I was using this in an actual, for an actual work piece, I would probably fill one side, see how it is, and then fill from the other side. Also, a really good trick for this is to start filling before you're down to your final dimension. That way you don't have to worry about what's going on, on the surface and if you have any bubbles or anything in the typically in the top of the epoxy pour those will be removed as part of the milling process and the epoxy will just become seamlessly part of the wood so the epoxy is going to flow down through the cracks so what we have to do is contain it so i like to use masking tape for that it works really great so i'm going to be pouring from this side and since this one has so many cracks in it I don't know which cracks are touching or which cracks are connected all the way through the board. So I'm going to go ahead and tape over all of the cracks just to be safe. When you're applying the tape, you want to make sure you press down really well so you can be sure that tape makes a nice tight seal against the wood so it doesn't end up leaking. And since this void goes all the way to the edge here, I'm going to put a piece of tape along the edge just to create a wall to keep that epoxy in the void. So the project that I'm working on right now is this casing molding for my house. And I have this big knot and it's really loose and there's like some parts kind of breaking off here. So I need to stabilize and address this if I want to use this whole board as one piece and not cut this and end up with two smaller pieces of trim. So ideally, you would fill these things before you mill the profile. So like that's what I have here. I got to this beforehand and filled it before I cut these, this um, casing profile on here. But in some cases, when you're cutting this deep, you just can't tell what's going to happen inside of the wood and you end up with something like this. So this is a really unique situation because this is profiled and we want to match this profile with the epoxy. So what we're going to actually do is um, dam up this side with some masking tape and then fill from the back side so that when the epoxy comes in here it actually fills this and conforms to the profile. So the epoxy that we're going to use is really loose and will flow really well into any cavities that might be in the wood. So really what you need to do is contain that epoxy so it doesn't run out everywhere. So what I'm doing here is using some masking tape to build up a profile or a bridge of that profile onto the void. So when the epoxy comes in through here and cures, it will have conformed itself and continue that profile on. And so now I can fill in from the back side and the epoxy will be in the same shape as the profile. So how about a slightly different example? So in this case we have this right here, but the void doesn't go all the way through the piece of trim. Well, in that case, I'm going to do something very similar. I'm actually going to drill a hole in here so that I can fill the epoxy from the back side. And since I'm using a tinted epoxy, that hole won't be visible. And since you'll never see the back side of this trim, the hole really isn't a problem. And again, I'll cover this side with some masking tape. The epoxy that I like to use is this West System epoxy. And at the core of this system is the resin. With the resin, you can add different hardeners as well as different fillers to get exactly the result you're looking for. So right out of the can with, a, with any of the hardeners, the epoxy is really loose and runny. So it will flow down into cracks and cavities, which is going to be perfect for this application. But for something like a glue up where you want to have a little bit more clinginess to the epoxy, you can add some fillers and that will make the epoxy a little thicker and stick to your work pieces a little better without running all over the place. The hardeners come in different set speeds. This is a slow hardener. I like to use this in my shop because I, I tend to use epoxy quite a bit for glue ups 
and with this um, slow hardener it gives me about 45 minutes of open time to do a glue up. You can also get the metering pumps for the epoxy so all you have to do is one pump of this, one pump of that and that will give you a perfect mix ratio for your epoxy. To color the epoxy I like to use trans tint dyes that work really well and they're available in a lot of different colors. In my shop I just have this medium brown and that's what I use the most for just about everything and I also have this bright red which I'll mix in with cherry which you'll see in this case just to give a little more of a red tone to the overall epoxy. I like to use these little plastic cups to mix my epoxy. You can get these pretty much anywhere for only a couple bucks for about a hundred of them. And then for a stir stick I have a off cut. <laughs> so I'm just going to do one batch right now which is going to be one pump of the resin. and one pump of the hardener. And I can give that a really good mix. So in this example I'm working with cherry and for that I like to add four drops of medium brown. And just like that you'll have a really dark almost black look to the epoxy. And since it's cherry, I like to add just a little bit of this bright red, just one drop, just to give a slight red hue to, to the epoxy. And now I can just start pouring the epoxy down into the cracks, let it flow down through the cracks, and then contact the tape on the other side. So when filling cracks, I like to start at just one side and let the epoxy flow down into, into the crack and hopefully fill from the bottom up so that there isn't any trapped air from just covering the whole top with epoxy and letting it go down because it will trap air in there and you'll end up with bubbles. So this way it allows the epoxy to flow down into the crack, bottom out, and then start filling up to the top. So one of the things you'll have to contend with is some bubbles on the surface. That's just from mixing the epoxy and from air inside the cracks working their way up through the epoxy. So there's a couple of things you can do to get rid of those. The first is to overfill the, the void that you're trying to fill. And that way the epoxy is on top of the surface of the wood. That's where the bubbles are going to be and you're going to end up playing that away anyway. So the bubbles are in the waste epoxy. The other thing you can do is if you have a blowtorch or some other heat source like a heat gun, you can just give it a quick pass of heat and that'll pop the bubbles and they'll be gone. The only thing you have to worry about there is you can cook the epoxy and ruin the top surface of it. So just be very careful you don't overheat it and cook it. So I'll maybe watch this for about 20 minutes and I'll keep adding epoxy as it goes down into the cracks until it slows down. And if I have to go somewhere, I just put a lot on the surface and whatever gets down into the cracks, so it gets down there. And what does then is it ends up on the surface and I'll remove that later on anyway. All right, so this piece is set up for about 18 hours now and I can go ahead and remove the tape and see how it looks. On the bottom side, it looks like just this big middle crack here actually went all the way through. So now that the epoxy is set up, I can run this whole thing through my planer to clean it up in one shot. That's the nice thing about filling the voids before you get your stock down to final dimension. You have basically no cleanup work and you can proceed with the rest of your project and then do your surface prep just like you would with any other piece of wood. The epoxy becomes part of the project part and basically part of the wood. Now surface prep on here is going to be exactly the same as whatever technique you like to use for surface prep, either sanding or scraping or planing. And with a finish applied, this is just some mineral spirits.
I really like this darker look because it really highlights the crack and I think this looks cool overall. You can see in this example I do have some voids here where the epoxy got pulled down and actually went through to the other side. That's that crack we saw earlier so if I was using this for an actual workpiece this would just need a second application of epoxy just to clean up this last little bit of uh, gap here. But the crack down on the other end is totally filled and looks great. So now let's take a look at the molding. So there you go. You can see the epoxy has conformed to the shape of the profile and there's just a little bit of cleanup work left to do. And I still have to sand and finish prep this molding anyway, so cleaning up this little bit of extra epoxy around the outside here is going to be part of that process anyway. So with this you can use either sandpaper or a card scraper. In this case it's a little weird because it's a piece of molding so it's going to be a little bit uh, different than just a flat board. Now on the back side of this molding you can see I have a lot of extra epoxy on the surface that needs to be removed. And this is exactly what you'll have when you're filling a crack or a void in an actual board. Here you can see how the bubbles actually rose to the surface and since I overfilled the area those bubbles are proud of the surface and when I go to remove this epoxy the bubbles will also be removed and the surface will be nice and flush. Most of the time I'll just go over with my sander and that seems to go pretty quickly. On this one I was filling in some rotted areas so the color from the epoxy kind of seeped into the surrounding wood which is what you'd expect in some rotted areas like this but still doesn't look terrible when it finishes applied. On this one here it's much less noticeable. You can actually see the epoxy kind of looks like it's part of a knot here. In this case again I wasn't really too worried about this backside, but I did have some bubbles in the surface so I have some surface voids and if you still have these or you have a lot of problems with these you can vibrate the material as you're applying the epoxy or if you do get them in the end it's not really a big deal all you have to do is just apply some more epoxy to the surface to fill in those holes and then you can sand it back again and you should be good to go. So that's about it. I use this quite a bit in my work because I really do like to incorporate a lot of cracks and defects into my work so filling those cracks and defects with epoxy stabilizes them and makes them stable enough to use in my final project. I'll have links to all of the stuff I showed today in the description down below if you're interested in taking a look at those products. And of course, as always, if you have any future Ask Matt topic suggestions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below or send me an email about that. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments about the epoxy or anything here in my shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I appreciate those and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, happy woodworking.